Thank you so much for, for having us here. Uh, we're grateful that you decided to import a few ethnographers uh, for, for this seminar. Um, so uh, we'd like, to, yes, to, to go into some ethnographic aspects of what Padma Sambhava is, means for, for Tibetans. Um, the outline of what I'd like to present today uh, is as follows. And a first point uh, will be really just providing a little bit of, uh, just a little bit of uh, broad framing uh, both for my talk, but also it's a bit of a framing in which we can see the, the three talks of this session um, take a different place, each one. Um, okay, so um, very briefly, but just a, a short word on what you could call analytical typologies of religious action. Um, as you know, a number of anthropologists in particular who've been looking at Buddhist religious fields have realized there is the need to try and gain some analytical clarity by making distinctions, analytical distinctions. And here we have two uh, early 1990s uh, formulations that are both indebted to Spiro's 1970 uh, formulation. Uh, I think that all of you are familiar with Jeffrey Samuel's formulation, so in which he distinguishes three primary aims of religious action. Um, there is the body dimension, uh, which is spiros, uh, nibbana, and so it's a soteriological aim. You have the karma dimension. We recognize here spiros category kamma. This is a more modest aim of trying to better one's karmic lot uh, through accumulation of merit and the like. And then a third part of religious activity uh, pragmatic uh, in Samuel's terms, which aims at producing results, modifying one's fate in the here and now, uh, healing rituals, rituals that aim at ensuring success, uh, long life, etc. Uh, now, if we look at what David Gellner, just a year before uh, Jeffrey Samuel proposed, uh, you'll note that we have a soteriological category and an instrumental category, the third one, that correspond to uh, the pragmatic. So we see that it maps quite well, but there is a second category that is actually quite different. Uh, Gellner has introduced a category of social religion. And what he means by social religion is that we can recognize quite clearly that a number of religious activities aim at sanctifying the social order, at reproducing in a religiously sanctified way social groups, uh, modifying or reconfirming social statuses, etc. If that is the primary aim of a given ritual, then that ritual should be identified as a social ritual, you could, you could say. So it's quite striking that there is no place for that in Jeffrey Samuels, or for that matter, in Spiro's uh, typologies. And it is actually quite true, even though Samuel's book is very thick, uh, the social dimensions of ritual, the political dimensions of ritual, are actually hardly present in, in his analysis. Uh, they were probably impossible to, over, to, to overlook in a newar caste society context where there are just abundant rituals aiming at uh, year after year sacralizing the social groups. Anyway, I would like to suggest that in the Tibetan context, we should look also at the social dimension of rituals. Now, what I'm going to suggest is that the Tsechu rituals that I'll be talking and similar rituals, I'm not going to say that those are social rituals per se in exactly the same way. I don't think that you can say that their primary aim as, their, um, as the um, uh, Tibetans who carry them out uh, perceive them. Uh, I don't think that for them it is primarily about uh, reaffirming, re, uh, reproducing in a sacralized way the social order. But Tibetans will speak spontaneously about the social dimension of these rituals that are primarily for them perhaps 
cult's worship of Padmasambhava that remains true. So th those rituals that I'm going to talk of, I would suggest that they are primarily soteriological, but that their actors clearly recognize there is a strong social dimension in them, right? Okay. Uh, another kind of perspective uh, that we're going to bring into the discussion today, um, we've been talking about uh, elite clergies primarily so far. Uh, we've been talking about the productions of uh, very literate uh, Buddhist specialists, right, yesterday. So today we'll be bringing into the picture the fact, well, that we, of course, need to fit the laity into the picture. So there'll be both specialists and lady that we'll be talking about. And within the specialists, one important distinction is that between monastic and non-monastic specialists, uh, the non-monastic ones, so those primarily family lineages of tantric priests that Tibetans most often call ngakpa, um, I call them following others, uh, tantrists. Um, so the contributions within this session, well, if I take, for instance, uh, what Monash Hemf will be discussing, there'll be primarily healing rituals at the center of, of her talk. And so in that sense, the primary aim of the ritual, if we follow, let's say, Gellner's uh, typology, we could say that there is something instrumental that is primary in there. However, uh, this does not mean, of course, that other components are ruled out. There remains a soteriological dimension. In healing, there's often the social relations that are part of understanding what causes the problem and what needs to be healed. Um, in the case of the rituals, uh, the ritual practices uh, presented by uh, Dr. Liu, uh, there will be maybe primarily a soteriological dimension, um, but other possible aims as well of those ritual practices. Um, there'll be some overlap in terms of the non-monastic uh, specialists with, uh, between the two talks by myself and, and Mona Schrempf, um, but we'll be also definitely looking at the laity. Um, so, so yeah, this is maybe a little bit of framing, um, and now we can uh, move on. So uh, just two very brief words. What about the sources? Well, it's ethnographic fieldwork in this case. Um, so two main societies in which I've worked for extended periods will be used as the basis from which I draw the data. Uh, Baragon or Lower Mustang, north of Nepal, a small society, uh, fieldwork in the 1990s, and my, my first book is a uh, presentation of Nakpas based on that data. Then since 2003, I've been carrying out fieldwork again and again in uh, the Repkong district in eastern Amdo, and here we have something much larger, something like 80,000 ethnic Tibetans or more by now. And it's a heartland, you could say, of Tibetan culture, even though it's really on the boundary. Uh, I mean, in, in terms of its cultural density, religious density and, and vitality. Um, there are similarities between those two very different societies. Similarities in the sense that you have a dense Buddhist and Bonpo religious presence in both cases. Uh, something of the order of 10%. Of, of the males are uh, religious specialists. Um, you have, in both cases also, something that is actually quite rare, uh, if you look at Tibet more broadly, namely what I call tantrist village communities. So those are villages in which you have a strong component of family lineages of tantrists, uh, a strong proportion of those in the village. And very often, you'll have the village religious life that is centered uh, to quite some extent on the religious activities of those priests. There might be the temple of those tantrists at the center of the village. So that's a tantrist village, a tantrist village community. And we find this kind of social religious grouping in both societies. But Repkong is much larger and, and shows a much wider spectrum of, of religious competence uh, training, etc. Okay, uh, you probably, most of you, know where to place them, but for those who maybe do not, um, here, oops, what was that? Yes, here is where uh, Baragon lies, um, just to give you a, a, a small a visual impression. This is one of the main valleys with just small villages here and there. This is a very small society. 
uh, if we go over to Repkong, and I've added the Chensa district, which lies just to the north of Repkong, because one of the rituals I'll be discussing uh, took place actually in Chensa district. So this is where we are now. And uh, here, it's obviously a very different picture. Uh, we've got a main big valley with a political center and a religious Giluk monastic center, historically very closely uh, interlinked. And in the outlying villages, you have those tantrist village communities, both Bunpo and Nyingma uh, for, for most of them. Okay. Um, it's, uh, so with Rongo Chen, this big monastery in the center, you have a large uh, center of learning, obviously. Uh, but if you look at, for instance, who the main, uh, the most, uh, the most preeminent uh, intellectual and religious figures are that came out of this area. Two of the most important ones actually came from the same group of villages that are tant tantrist village communities, Shompong in the northeast of Repkong. So Shapkar and Gindun Chöpel are from the same group of villages and from this tantrist Nyingma background. And here you have a picture taken on the occasion of one of their large ritual gatherings of uh, elders of different uh, Tantrist village communities. Um, they collectively, all of the Nyingmapa Tantrists in Ripkong are known as the 1900 ritual dagger holders. And this is a collective designation that is exceedingly prestigious throughout Amdo. And there's a clear sense of religious identity, of collective identity uh, that unites these people. Uh, a sense of collectivity uh, that is linked to, to that name and that comes alive in the large religious gatherings. Okay, so um, I'd like just to say two words on the fact that we find in this tantrist subculture within Tibet, we find Padmasambhava at the center in, in a variety of ways. Uh, so Padmasambhava, Padmasambhava is understood to be uh, at the origin uh, of the introduction of tantric teachings into Tibet. That's, of course, one thing, uh, and not, you could say, specific to these communities. Uh, Padmasambhava is also a central divine figure uh, for many of the practices uh, that they engage in. And maybe most specifically, in the case of these tantrists, there is this understanding that the monks are followers of Shakyatuva, so of the Buddha Shakyamuni, and uh, Padmasambhava, uh, Padmasambhava's followers are the Nakpa, are the Tantrists. Uh, he is an archetype for them, right? Uh, he was himself a non-monastic figure. And the, so there is this understanding that they are his followers. Um, and so in many ways, Padmasambhava is at the center. And we'll look now at ways, in ritual ways, in which we find uh, Padmasambhava there as well. Um, one, of the, um, one of the themes that strikes me as, as spontaneously coming up quite often in a variety of ways in, in local discourse is turns around the, these notions of absence and presence of Padmasambhava. And of course, these are themes that you are all familiar with in other contexts as well. Uh, but it's, it's quite striking in, in the present context. Um, so, of course, we could start by mentioning the fact that this is an emanation body, so this is already a certain form of presence in the world that this implies. Um, but then there is, in particular, this presence of Padmasambhava on the 10th lunar day. Uh, he will be there in, in person, uh, actually, uh, on the 10th day of the lunar month says one of the, the most well-known prayers to Padmasambhava. There are prayers that call the guru from afar, right? Uru, uh, the, the guru gyanbe, uh, organ uh, gyanbe, uh, different, uh, different titles like that. Uh, so there is this presence that is, you could say, circular, especially on the 10th day. And there are rituals that call the guru, that call Padmasambhava, that beseech him for, for, for help. Uh, for his blessings. Um, you have also uh, a certain number that, that, was quite, that is quite striking in the Repkong district, for instance. A certain number of people uh, recite every day the, the condensed life of Padmasambhava, the Katangdupa, uh, the Kapdi, as, as they would say. 
And, um, and then you have just simply mantras uh, that are recited. Uh, Padmasambhava's mantras can be recited by so, so, some people uh, on a daily basis. Um, so there's, a, there's a, a strong presence, ritual presence in many ways. Uh, and let us look now at one key ritual, these 10th day, 10th uh, lunar day worship rituals. And so a first element uh, that I'd like to discuss is the fact that basically we're looking at one kind of ritual, but there are two communities that are associated, if you want to look at it analytically, in the sense that these rituals are supported materially by the lay community most often. I'm talking of the case, for instance, of those Tibetan, uh, of those uh, Repkong, Nakpa, uh, Tantrist uh, uh, village communities, right? So you have a concentration of Nakpas in the village, but you have also just plain laity. And so they will be bringing the, the, the material basis for the ritual. And it's a ritual that circulates in the, in the village in a given way, as we'll see in a minute. So that's the one way in which we see the lay community associated with it. And then the Tantrists, all the Tantrists of that particular village are supposed to gather on that day together. And there is another community, it's this community of practitioners that also is very much associated with the ritual. Um, here, an example of such a tzitzu uh, in one of these villages in Repkong. Uh, the altar, so we're here in a house. When it's, it's a ritual that turns in rotation among the households of the village. More precisely, as it is a monthly ritual, you'll have, as in the case of this village, 12 sections within the village that have a monthly rotation among themselves, and then they draw lots to see who will get to actually host the ritual within a given section in a given month. Uh, but it's always from the bottom of the village to the top. Every year, the same rotation on a monthly basis. And so it's in a house that uh, the ritual takes place, the altar uh, you see at the back, and then the village's tantris, or those who are present on that day, are here to carry out the ritual. Uh, you see um, also, in some cases, uh, women. And this is something that I haven't mentioned yet, uh, but that I'll come back to uh, again. Uh, we have currently in Repkong a striking surge of nama, uh, of a development of a religious category that actually hardly existed as a, as a category for in Tibetan, in Tibetan understandings until very recently. This term, nagma, is hardly to be found, hardly to be heard elsewhere in Tibet, and was hardly used until 10, 15 years ago in Repkong. But you have currently now villages in Repkong where you have twice as many nama as nakpa. Uh, so there's been an enormous surge in their numbers, and that's a whole thing in itself that I won't go into, but they also gather for 10th day uh, ritual gatherings, uh, in some cases the 25th day, but in some cases, as here in this village, it's on the 10th day. And in some villages, the Nakba and Nangma will gather together for a, co for a joint collective practice um, on the Tzichu. So, an important point is what the Tzichu means with regard to becoming a Tantrist or, or being a Tantrist over the course of one's life. Yes, thank you. I'll try and be quick. Oops. Um, basically, when you start off as a tantrist, there is no ordination as there is monastic ordination that makes you a monk. But what in those communities make, makes you a tantrist is most commonly the fact that you start participating in the monthly tzechu. And from that point on, you're a ngakpa of that village, and it is assumed that every month from that point on, you'll be taking part. And there's this strong understanding that as a tantrist, you will take part in these rituals. There's something virtually identitarian in the carrying out of the tzechu as a tantrist every month. Uh, it's an emblem emblematic practice for tantrists. And then let's, at a last point, I'd like to uh, come to some larger forms of uh, tzichu rituals, they are often called uh, tzichu chemo, that can be, for instance, on the, the sixth lunar month, which is the monkey month, associated more particularly with Padmasambhava. And there you find certain forms of larger religious gatherings in Nyimapa contexts, 
Uh, and in some places, every year, the, you'll have a Tsitsu Chemo with larger, more large-scale uh, gatherings. In a, for instance, in one key temple, P uh, Tantrists and Nagma, uh, in, in some of these cases, will assemble for, for such rituals. Um, in one of those cases, uh, what is quite clear is that it was found to be an easier way to include the Nagma to make them take part in a ritual on, the, on one of those Tichu days than to include them for a tantric practice that had stricter criteria for participation. And so there's an inclusive character also that this ritual can have. So one example, one key example that I talked about uh, already a number of years ago, this is a 204 ritual, took place in Achu Namzong, a sacred site in the Chensa district, just north of Ripkong. Uh, the organizing master, uh, now uh, passed away, but uh, Alak Tolo, uh, explained that uh, out of the, 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 the strength of his faith for Padmasambhava, as this year 204, which was a wood monkey year, was coming up, he felt the need to do something big in honor of Padmasambhava, and so he worked all his networks to make as many tantras come as possible. There were more in the end than he even thought that there would be probably something like 3,500 tantrists came for one week of practice. And this one week was centered on the 10th day of the monkey month. And probably the largest ever uh, gathering of tantrists in the Tibetan world, I mean, there's little thing, in t little in terms of data that we can back this up with, but definitely something enormous. Um, so this is the main temple. You can see, so there's this big court courtyard where everybody was taking place. Uh, this is how it looks like. Uh, and you don't really see that it's just massive, but there are 3,000 people there. Um, and there were two elements that were really striking with regard to this uh, presence of Padmasambhava. The ritual would start at 4 or 4.30 every morning and would start with calling the master from afar. And that was a very particular ritual with everybody standing up, which is quite rare in Tibetan liturgical ritual. And it was still pitch dark. And you'd have 3,000 voices in this slow chant calling for Padmasambhava to come. It was I mean, I was really taken emotionally by, by, by that day after day. And, and on the 10th day, the, the Gana Chakra was particularly large, so there was this talk, Gana Chakra offerings as the basis of, of that ritual every day. And in the evening, it had rained all day, but in the evening, the rain stopped and a rainbow appeared. This was the end, so everybody had stopped the practice. The temples are, are you can't see them, but at the bottom of, of, the, sh of the cliff there. And above the temples, you had a rainbow. And for people there, that was a clear sign, right? Padmasambhava was there. This was the 10th day, particular month, particular year in the 60-year cycle. I mean, this was a, a, a day in their lives, right? And, and Padmasambhava was very close on that day. So a word of conclusion. The good thing with being the last one to talk, I mean, talking today is that I had time to come up with some sort of conclusion. So it's not maybe fully social religion in Gellner's terms, but there's a strong social dimension here, as we said. So those are community rituals, both for the lay people and for the tantrists, emblematic rituals for tantrists, as I said, serving on top of it as rites of entry into this status of being a tantrist of the community. And then typically in their Gana Chakra form, there's a word missing there, uh, they, these Tsitsu rituals have a very inclusive character and in particular, can lend themselves to a gender inclusiveness uh, that other contexts make maybe more difficult. Um, what maybe also uh, is one of the factors enabling this is the shared faith in a supreme religious figure, in this case, Padmasambhava. Uh, and that, of course, is a source of cohesiveness one can understand. OK, I've, I'm slightly beyond time. Thank you very much.
<laughs> okay. Um, ah, oh, one too far. Okay. So we continue with uh, Padmasambhava as the central figure um, in the framework of a communal Tsechu ritual, but we will shift uh, towards Bhutan, uh, where I did some field work um, between 2010 and 2012 and sponsored by the German Research Foundation. It was a sort of pilot project looking at a um, variety of ritual healers. Um, in uh, trying to figure out what kind of people do actually ritual healing, which was my main interest. And I did field work mainly in Eastern Bhutan. I'm not sure, is it, does it work? So this part of uh, Bhutan was my main concern. I also did some field work in Arunachal, which is just bordering here, Arunachal Pradesh, Northeast India. Um, there's lots of interesting sharing of culture going on, but you have to imagine this is a very multilingual, multicultural area. So it's not like there's one Bhutan and there's one Dzongka language and nothing else. Dzongka is the lingua franca, very much modeled after classical Tibetan, but, uh, or modern Tibetan rather. Um, but we have many, many small communities here um, who speak a lot of different languages and lots of migration going on, also lots of urbanization. Most people from the east, uh, they call themselves Shachokpa, they are moving towards Timpu, the main uh, city, and of course Bhutan is a small country. You shouldn't forget in small in terms of population, about seven to 800,000 people. So very different from Nepal, very different from uh, India, of course, and China, and of course, it's one of these Himalayan buffer states that's kind of caught up in all the politics and geopolitical uh, yeah, agendas that are out there and continuously changing until today. Um, yep, yeah. and so it's a very uh, fascinating area. So here you see our Guru Rinpoche, how he's called in, in Bhutan, Padmasambhava. And you have Samye Monastery. Um, you have heard already about Samye Monastery and this big myth of uh, Padmasambhava subduing um, an um, uh, a demon that was kind of trying to, you know, stop Samye from being built. So he's the big subduer of demons, Padmasambhava, and as such, he's very much also venerated by everybody in Bhutan, lay people in particular. So I would say Padmasambhava is really a sort of integrative, salvational figure, at least from my point of view of my three um, examples that I'm giving you today um, in terms of uh, his healing power because he's also known as, uh, through his tantric powers, um, to be able to generate um, basically blessings that are, have healing properties. And it is interesting because there's incredible activity going on and similar to you, um, Nicolas, who has mentioned that there's a growth actually in, in Tantrists going on in Repgong. We have a cult of Padmasambhava that is amazing. In fact, we have apparently, so it's claimed, the largest statue ever built, I'm not so sure about that, but anyway, in Lunze, uh, just uh, finished in 2015, it cost 700 million nu, which is the same as uh, rupees, so apparently around about 9 million US dollars um, by some Druk Odiyana Foundation, um, an NGO that was built up in, in, uh, by some Lama here in this area. And over, I don't know, many, many years, at least five years, uh, lots of donations were con um, collected and a huge statue was built here uh, in Lunse district of Padmasambhava as an incredibly large figure of 157 feet high. So that's about 50 meters. I always have to count in, you know, European German terms. So anyway, a large statue that was very costly. And interestingly, this has become a new pilgrimage site, of course. Padmasambhava is there now in, as a statue, as a big, large, uh, you know, um, more than a representation, obviously his presence is there visibly, very visibly, and 
um, this statue also attracts pilgrims but, um, from all over the place and locals as well, but also tourists. So uh, development in Bhutan is always connected with culture. That's their biggest seller, so to speak. Yeah, Bhutanese culture is, of course, fantastic and unique in many ways that it's maybe, this is a question, of course, preserved. Uh, I don't like the word preserved because everything is changing as we know, but the claim is that there are more traditions uh, existing uh, in Bhutan today than in other places, and I think that could be true, at least in terms of ritual healers. That's what I found, the immense variety, diversity, and actually existing practices of ritual healing are, are really amazing. So um, I'm going to focus on three examples. Uh, ethnographic examples. I'm an anthropologist like Nicolas, so I did uh, field work there. And this, the first one is Gompu Kora, um, which is here, here, down here. So the story of Gompu Kora, shortly told, but Masambhava um, was chasing the demon that was obstructing the building of Samye down south along a river valley, as you can see, which is an old trading route. And of course, that's no coincidence. It's, I mean. It's not uh, an incident, not an incident, kind of coincidence. <laughs> okay, and um, so interestingly enough, pilgrimage and trade have always been married, and of course it makes sense if you move along, you, you, you have to finance yourself somehow, and uh, Tibetans were always traders, and um, also Bhutanese, so you have Assam, sort of the lower plains down here with different items and goods, and then you have Bhutan in the middle, and these river valleys were very classically trading and pilgrimage roads. So Gompu Kora used to be a very important, or rather important, at least in Eastern Bhutan, or today's Eastern Bhutan, <coughs> important pilgrimage place where trading was happening and coming over, people uh, coming over from Tawang area, the Mampas they're called, in the Menu Corridor that was also used to be part of the southern Tibetan uh, part of the former Tibetan empire, um, sorry, not empire, I should say state, um, of the, you know, uh, the Gandan Podrang, and until even rather late, um, until the 1950s, really, until 1959, and then there was the Indian-Chinese border war in 1962, and the borders were closed, so this kind of trading pilgrimage site, of course, was changed through political agendas and there was, you know, there's hardly any, but there's a bit nomadic kind of um, exchange on the border, but otherwise rather f mm, military borders between two, the two largest states in Asia we have. So um, it's a very interesting corner for many reasons historically, but also at present. And at the Gompu Kura uh, still today, Tawang Pass come over the border. Five minutes, oh God, okay. <laughs> I try uh, to make it short. Come over the border to participate in the Tsechu. So this Tsechu at Gompu Kura is really a lay pilgrimage festival. Uh, I will not go into detail that the Drukpa Kagyu monastic uh, congregation of Tashigang, which is right next door, has taken over this lay pilgrimage and turned it into its own kind of state development, what have you, ritual. But I focus on the lay pilgrimage side, which I think is anyway the older and the more interesting one. And so what's happening here is we have Sangdok Peri, the famous paradise of Guru Padmasambhava, uh, as a rock, it's a big, large rock, and uh, if you're lucky, if you have good karma, some particular sacred water is oozing out of the rock, and you can drink it, and of course, it's a chimiki dutsi, it's a water of long life, and it gives you, you know, blessings and healing and long life and all these good things we all want. And uh, so there's lots of different types of purification uh, with sacred water going on. Uh, but the whole place is embodied with stories and narratives of Guru Padmasambhava's subjugation of this demon that he was chasing down from Samye. So there are his footprints and various other body part prints of Padmasambhava, but also of Yishe Tsogya, all around, uh, sorry, all around this huh? rock. Where is it? I, I don't know. It's 
bit hard to see for you, but there's a big, large tree next to it. So this is the rock, and um, this is a sort of, you know, Kora path around it. The temple here, there's the Cham place for mask dancers. Um, but people also do pilgrimage along here. This is the Drangmichu, a gushing river uh, full of rock sites that are full of Padmasambhava's imprints. And people, actually lay people, go there, do prostrations, uh, slide down some rocks. And this is actually, you know, the three worlds, the hell realm and what have you. And if you're lucky, um, you, you know, you don't enter hell realm, you just stop beforehand and you get helped, of course, so that it won't happen. And then there's n many nice things like white stones and black stones. You have to try and catch the white one because the white one is good luck and so on. So many, many different ways of doing pilgrimage that are very common in the Tibetan realm as well. Um, but Guru Rinpoche is said to have meditated here for three months and finally was able to subdue this evil demon that was originally fleeing from Samye in this particular place in Kapalidafu, which is actually a cave right uh, north of this particular place, um, is the actual sacred site. And from there, the sacred spring comes forth and has been guided through a pipeline down to the actual pilgrimage uh, site down here so that pilgrims actually can get some blessing. So, um, yeah, uh, this is another, this is the, uh, basically the Jukpa Kagyu monastic uh, performance ritual that we have, um, but at the same time, of course, Guru Padmasambhava is present, is made present as a huge tanka, a tong drill, a tanka that enables uh, the, the onlooker to be liberated in a soteriological way. At least, of course, that's a claim, but that's also what people believe. So they line up here and get the blessing and uh, from this tanka. And of course, the guru himself also appears as a cham figure with uh, large, very large cham figure, larger than any others. And so there are many other, there are small termas in the temple of Guru Padmasambhava. And interestingly, they are also sometimes reinterpreted as tertun terma. So depending on who you ask what this is, you get also different answers. But that's also, I think, quite common. So we, we don't have it with texts. By the way, if you're interested in, uh, in the film that I made, it's half an hour. Um, this is where you can find it on Vimeo. You just put in Gumpu Koratsichu and my name, and you can watch it uh, quietly rather than in five minutes. So just images here and, you know, just ways of what I already said, um, of blessings from guru um, via statues that you touch and uh, recitation prayers and so on. So we come to the second example um, of a tantric practitioner. They're called Tsampa. Uh, Tsam in, in terms of uh, retreat, yeah, and surrounding a fence that you draw to be separate from lay people and uh, sort of this worldly concerns. So he's a tantric practitioner um, in Kuma Valley, which is a very interesting, another very interesting region, uh, not too far from Gompukura, but further to the north and center of Bhutan, still in East Bhutan. Uh, but it's a place where we have uh, Tertan lineages until today. So families who actually have partly terma or at least claims to lineages of Tertun that go like uh, Guru Chewang, who's one of the earliest Tertun we actually know of, and also Ratna Lingpa. So a uh, very interesting area. And um, I came across him through Doji Gyaltsen, who was my translator, uh, this um, Tsampa or meditator or a tantric practitioner is speaking Zala language, one of the many different languages we have there, very far away from anything Tibetan, uh, at least orally. So uh, I really also uh, badly needed uh, Doji, who was excellent. He knows five different languages, among them classical Tibetan and modern Tibetan and Dzongka and all these other local languages. So. It, he was perfect. Without him, I couldn't have done this field work. So the interesting thing was, um, 
uh, Tsampatsetin is healing with edible letters, or rather mantras. One minute, wow, okay. So this is his lineage, basically. Um, he was taught by Yangma Rinpoche um, in, Koma village, in, in Koma Valley, actually not village, a uh, very famous local healer who seems to have passed away about in the end of the 1970s. And his Teaton lineage is uh, going back to uh, Jigmi Lingpa, apparently. So, or at least he's connected with the Teaton, uh, with teachings of the Teaton, whether he himself is the actual follower, it wasn't really clear to me. But Jigmi Lingpa is, um, that we have here in the Rubin Museum, the statue, um, the important Teaton from the 18th century. Um, uh, that is the teaching that got, uh, that he got the transmission of. And this is Sampatsetin's Terma document for healing with edible letters. Um, just to shortly show you, this is uh, basically a woodblock print that we have here to the right. This is the woodblock print that he actually made himself, but copying it from his teacher, Yangma Rinpoche. And uh, these are um, mantras here. Yeah, this is the sort of the stamp of this woodblock onto paper, which is then uh, has particular meanings, particular mantras for different diseases, uh, zane in particular, but also others, epilepsy and uh, all kinds of hepatitis and very big variety. I mean, what we could call would call hepatitis today. Um, big variety of diseases, so not just kind of whatever spirit inflicted uh, diseases. And um, that's how he heals. That's one part of his healing. The other one is Tibetan medicine. So unfortunately, I can't go into this uh, translation, but if you're interested in this mantra healing edible letter kind of thing, I published an article about it and it will appear in Pierre Sargero's Buddhism and Medicine anthology very soon. Um, should come out very within this year anyway. So uh, you can read about it. And the interesting thing is, of course, just shortly, there's a, it's a terma. Uh, there's a reference to Tokun Yangwan, who we already heard about, very important tertun uh, of the uh, Ningtik tradition, transmission. Uh, but it's also interesting, and I think that is really the main kind of purpose of Padmasambhava in these diverse healing rituals is he's a salvational figure, but for here and now, for this worldly means, for healing, for long life, uh, in particular, not only, but also uh, really more like sort of the, the, you know, more than a soteriological figure or salvational figure in general, he's really here for healing people, for making sure that in this age of decline and disease and, uh, you know, this, this general rhetoric that we find all over uh, the Buddhist world, um, that Padmasambhava is really the, sal the salvational figure to help us getting out of this misery. So um, this is how he heals. He also knows Tibetan medicine. I just shortly want to show uh, these images. So this is uh, Lama Rinchen to the right here with a particular treasure, a uh, head relic of Shirab Memba, another very important uh, tertun in Pangbesa, which is to the west, in the western um, part in Paro, near Paro um, of Bhutan. And here's an image. Uh, of Shirab member that you see in this gompa here. And the ma amazing thing that's, uh, that's happening here is he has a terdo, a terma stone, that also oozes out. Uh, I'm not sure if you can see that here, but apparently, and Tony saw it with his own eyes and swears it's true, um, there is some kind of water oozing out of this terdo. And this is a ring cell, uh, a, a self-produced, uh, you know, magic uh, sign or Padmasambhava's power that is used to produce these pills, these um, rubu um, pills here, uh, that are very famous, of course, mixed with medicinal ingredients together with these, with this terma, and are produced in uh, in such a form that is sort of very close to 
the jewel pills that you might know of Tibetan medicine, but they're warned they're not taken because they have a salvational goal to prevent you from a bad rebirth and actually give you, you know, uh, nirvana basically before you die. So that's when you're supposed to take that pill. But so this is an interesting kind of overlap where you have this kind of mixed, uh, what um, Nicholas said, uh, sort of claimed, you know, through Gellner's perspective. But basically, I find, anyway, I find it's all mixed. It's difficult to differentiate these different aspects. But the interesting thing is, of course, what is stressed by whom. Yeah, okay, thank you. <laughs> Uh, so, thank you. I'm the last uh, presenter for, for this seminar. Uh, so, it's an honor for me to attend this uh, seminar, and also I have to th thank uh, my old classmate, uh, Professor Tato, uh, inviting me to, to this seminar. And uh, I'm working in the National Palace Museum in Taiwan, and uh, so I'm not an anthropologist, so I or still, I mainly study text. I'm working in the department of uh, rare books and historical documents. And uh, but in the past few years, the uh, Taiwanese government, especially the department, is called the Commission of Mongolian Tibetan Affairs. So uh, this uh, department is now no, no longer exists. Uh, last year, merged with the Ministry of Cultural Affairs. And uh, so they asked me, three years ago, they asked me to write a, 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 a book about uh, Tibetan Buddhism in Taiwan. And uh, so in uh, 2016, uh, I published a, a small book it's about the Nima school in, in Taiwan. And uh, last year, uh, uh, we published another small book it's about uh, the Gaju school in Taiwan. And uh, so the, the two books are not very academic because it's a government uh, publication. But I still I can took this chance to do some survey for, the, for, the, for Tibetan Buddhism in Taiwan. So uh, today my, uh, my topic is mainly focused on the uh, Padma Sambhava's uh, uh, teachings in Taiwan. And uh, so, so you know, it's mainly related with uh, like uh, Nyingma and uh, or Gaji school. But uh, then later I will introduce two, two Dharma teachings uh, now being taught and uh, practiced in Taiwan. It's not, uh, both of them are not from the Nyingma school. It's, uh, so, so, so here, I'll first I'll give you some of the historical uh, background. Uh, so, First of all, the Tibetan Buddhism came to Taiwan only after 1949. I think it's, it's, it's because of the Kuomintang government moving to Taiwan. And uh, so before 1980s, uh, so at that time, the, uh, the, the, the very few Tibetan Buddhism being taught uh, before 1980s. And uh, uh, the teachings re related with Padma Sambhava were mainly spread by some Han Chinese lay Buddhists. Uh, so they, they were uh, disciples of uh, either uh, this uh, Nola Kututu or uh, Kanga Rinpoche. I think for their background, uh, uh, if you are interested, you can read Professor Tato's book about the, the past history. And, uh, but here I just want to point out that uh, maybe the, this uh, Nola Kututu, probably he was the first uh, Tibetan Buddhist master Introducing Padma Sambhava's uh, biographies to the Han Chinese. Uh, so, uh, so uh, I just uh, uh, talk about him briefly. So, he was the cousin of the seventh uh, Jejun Rinpoche from the Ryoche Monastery. And uh, as you know, the Ryoche actually belonged to the Dalongaju tradition, but also quite uh, especially in the in the, since the maybe 18th, 19th century, the Ryoche was also very influenced from the Nima uh, tradition. And uh, he was a cousin of the seven uh, Ryoche Jejong, 
And the seven Ryuqi Zhejiong uh, was already a very famous theatron in the beginning of the 20th century. And uh, so, but uh, uh, so, so he, his name in, in for Tibetans uh, it was known as the Gara Lama. So only when he, uh, in some way, escaped to the to 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 Beijing, so he used the name of. Uh, uh, so right now we write as uh, Nola, but uh, I I hear from uh, one of his uh, I think grand grand nephew. He said it's, it should be Nula. He, he said at that time he, he uh, did not want to uh, talk about his real background. So when the Han Chinese uh, disciple asked uh, where, uh, what's your name? He said, uh, he, he just said, I'm a Lama from the West. Okay, and, uh, uh, but the, the, he, at that time he only taught about uh, Nima teachings, especially the Dharma. And, uh, but from the, at present, all his teachings now translated into Chinese. Uh, so it's from various uh, Dharma traditions. So he taught about uh, like uh, the, the prayers uh, uh, from the Guru Chu Wang's uh, Dharma and also prayers from Rizin Guidin's Dharma. And uh, when his uh, Chinese uh, disciple asked about his uh, uh, lineage, the lineage he, he gave actually is uh, from the Bayu tradition. So he, Talk about uh, the Gunsang Shira, then uh, the, the Gama Chame Gunsang Shira, then the Bema Nobu. So, so he didn't want to say about uh, his uh, real chair tradition, but he also introduced uh, uh, some of his cousins uh, uh, Dharma, and he he also uh, introduced the 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 uh, Palma Sambhava's uh, biography. The biography I think is related with the Rizin Guiden's. Uh, uh, Dharma, uh, the uh, biography. And uh, then uh, another important and famous uh, Buddhist teacher, uh, uh, teach, uh, he uh, taught for the, the, the Han Chinese uh, people is the Ninth Kangar Rinpoche. I think uh, as maybe many of you, you know already, uh, he was from Gamagaji tradition. And uh, this picture was, uh, his, uh, he, uh, he took with the 16 Gamaba. And uh, because he was the Yongzing, he was a teacher for the 16 Gamaba. And uh, when he uh, was invited into like uh, Chengdu or Nanjing to teach, uh, he taught uh, uh, in one way mainly about, uh, from the Gamagaji tradition. But uh, because uh, Kangar Muche, he was also the disciple of the famous uh, Kempo Shenga from the Dzogchen Monastery. So he also taught about uh, from the Longchen Ninti tradition. And also he taught uh, uh, the, the Gamma Ninti, also translated into Chinese. Uh, the Gamma Ninti uh, supposed to be the Dharma from the third Gamma Ba Rong Zheng Duoji. Okay. And uh, so uh, uh, since the 1980s, because of the society in Taiwan, it became gradually much more opener. And uh, so at that time, many Tibetan Lamas and Rinpoches were invited to Taiwan to, to teach, and mainly from, from the, uh, either India or Nepal. And uh, uh, so uh, in, uh, since the 1980s until now, so uh, maybe since the year 2000, we also can see that uh, uh, quite a lot of uh, Tibetan Buddhist master being directly uh, invited from, from Tibet to Taiwan. And so nowadays, I, here are just a rough, uh, a very rough data. So uh, right now from the, uh, the, the, the Tibetan Buddhist centers officially registered to the, uh, to the government as, as more than 400 uh, centers. And there are more uh, around, at least uh, 10 uh, Buddhist monasteries, I mean the, the, in Tibetan style. So, only, I think only two of them are from the Geluba school. The other eight, uh, all either from Gaju or from, from Nima. So at least two of them from the Nima school. Okay. And uh, uh, so, uh, 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 so if you calculate the, based on the centers, so uh, here I just say that the more than 60% from the Gaju or Nima uh, uh, tradition, and uh, 
so they brought uh, all kinds of Padmasambhava's uh, teachings. So right now in Taiwan, I think all the major Dharma lineages has been taught in Taiwan. So for example, the, 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 either the Changde tradition, Lode tradition, or, or like, uh, like uh, the Namche, uh, et cetera, all, all kinds of. And uh, so then here I would introduce uh, two uh, more unique uh, Dharma practice uh, taught in Taiwan. Uh, so both the, uh, this, uh, these two Dharma comparatively is new. It's uh, uh, mainly from the, one, one is actually from uh, the uh, early 20th century. Okay. And uh, both of them from Nanqian. And, uh, uh, and that one practice is more focused on the deity practice. So, so if, uh, uh, according to uh, Nicholas, uh, uh, his, uh, his uh, uh, classification, so one dharma is more related with the soteri soteriological purpose. And the other one uh, mainly focus on the ritual group practice. So maybe it's more the uh, social or instrumental purpose. And uh, so, and the one, so one Dharma tradition was uh, kept by the Jigongaju school. So uh, Jigongaju is very uh, popular uh, and influential in the Nanchen area. And the other Dharma is from the uh, Sakya school. So first, uh, uh, this uh, Dharma from the Qigong Gajit School. Uh, this is, was from the, uh, this uh, usually called the Jidir or Zadoji. Jidir meaning Dirdum uh, from the Qigong Gajit. And uh, so he was, uh, he, he, uh, from the picture you can see that actually he's not a monk, he's a Ngaba. And uh, so his family tradition still, uh, now is still uh, 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 available in Nanchen. So he's, uh, uh, his son and his grandson still in charge of, uh, uh, I think, two monasteries in, in the Nanqing area. And uh, uh, his derma includes uh, 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 quite uh, different kinds, with uh, like a Guru Jabo, with the Puba, the Varakilaya, and also with uh, the Achi. Achi is a, a, a unique uh, uh, a, a Dharma protector in the Qigong Gaju tradition. And, uh, 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 in one way is that the, uh, this Archie actually is a, it's a not, a, it's, it's a historical figure. He was the great grandmother of the founder of the Jigong Gaju school, Jiting Gunbo. And uh, uh, Gunsa Doji, he established his, sen his monastery actually at the, uh, the, the, the practice uh, cave of this uh, Archie Chuji Joma. And he also extract his derma from, uh, from the cave. And, uh, and according to his uh, prophecy, he said that his uh, two main lineage holder will be two lojo. So one is uh, Shui lojo. Shui lojo is the 34th throne holder of the Jigong Gaju school. It's, uh, he was the sixth Jigong Jiangong Chizai Rinpoche. The, the present one is the seventh, uh, the, so his uh, previous incarnation. And the other one is uh, Jian, Jian Qinze, Zongsa Qinze Church uh, so, so, uh, uh, and uh, uh, because of limited time, I've, I've, I just introduced here is uh, uh, about this Dezhong uh, Doji's biography. We, until right now, we don't have uh, official uh, official biography written in Tibet, in, uh, written in Tibetan, and uh, but uh, there is uh, one uh, Chinese biography written by a, a Chinese Lama, uh, Master Gen Zhao, because in 1948 he, when he went to Tibet to, to 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 uh, to learn the teaching, he learned from the Gunsa Doji, and also at that time when Gunsa Doji was transmitting the. The, line, the Dharma lineage to, to Zongsa Qinzi, so he was there, and so he knows about the biography. So he wrote some uh, information uh, in his uh, memoir. And uh, so this picture uh, was taken during his uh, second trip uh, to, to, to Tibet. So uh, uh, here you can see it's in July uh, 1954, and uh, the, the, the one sitting in front is the Sakya Dachen the right one is uh, Dingu Qinzi Rinpoche. 
and uh, the one beside him is the Zongsa Qingzi Rinpoche. And uh, according to Ngozha Doji's uh, prophecy, he said, except these two, two main lineage hold, holder, there will be four minor lineage holder in four different, uh, in four directions. The one in East, uh, he said, uh, is this uh, Langcheng Gyabu Rinpoche. And uh, he is the, uh, according to Ngozha Doji, he is the holder for his uh, Red Dara uh, Dharma practice. And, uh, and uh, but uh, however, uh, 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 Lang Chen he escaped to India after 1959. But uh, when he was in India, because uh, he uh, did not get the, he, he, he didn't bring uh, Ngozha Doji's Dharma with him. So he just uh, keep this practice by himself. He did not uh, uh, teach. So only until uh, 1998, so some of the uh, Ngozha Doji's uh, writings, his, uh, his uh, derma uh, has been rediscovered either uh, in, in, I think in Lhasa and also in, in uh, Nanchen. So gradually, uh, because he got uh, this uh, root text, so he composed uh, uh, new sadhanas, and uh, he until uh, 2011. So he began to to give the Red Dara initiation to the uh, Chinese, uh, Taiwanese uh, disciples. So this is a picture he uh, he when he gave this initiation uh, in 2012. Uh, the one seat beside him is another young Qigong uh, Gaoju Rinpoche, Gar uh, Nangzhu Rinpoche. He is also from the Nanchen area. So he. Uh, received uh, this uh, lineage from, from, from him. And uh, so this is a mandala uh, during the initiation because it's a red dara, so all the offerings is prepared uh, in, in, in red. And uh, the Zali uh, picture here I, I shown is, a, is a Lang Chun, which is his own hand uh, depiction. So it's a very simple painting. And, uh, but uh, the one behind you can see there's uh, also one uh, statue is made of uh, red coral. And uh, uh, so he, I will, maybe I, sk I skipped. <laughs> uh, so in 2004 and also in 2012, so the Ngozha Derma has been uh, uh, reprinted and, uh, and, uh, and uh, uh, recompiled and printed in, in, so 2004 in Lhasa and 2012 in, in Nanchen. And uh, the, the chief edit, editor for this volume, uh, this uh, Bong Chun Buche, he was the main uh, successor from uh, Lang Chen Buche. So he uh, uh, included uh, this uh, Red Dara's uh, teachings uh, in, in this uh, new published volume. And uh, so in, in the in Rinpoche Center in Taiwan, so this uh, uh, Red Dara Sadhana also translated into Chinese. It's a short sadhana, so, so the, 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 the Taiwanese disciple can uh, re uh, practice according to, to this uh, ritual. And uh, so the, the second uh, derma I, I introduced here is, uh, is a derma uh, from the Sagya school. Uh, it's uh, based on, the, uh, uh, it was uh, taught by the Charu Rinpoche. Charu Rinpoche, he, uh, this derma was uh, discovered by the first uh, Charu Rinpoche. So you can see it's uh, in the 18th century. But uh, at that time, this derma was kept a secret only, in the, uh, only by himself. Only until the fifth Charu Rinpoche, and uh, he compiled this derma into a whole set of rituals, and uh, he offer this dharma to the 39th Sagya Tritsin, so in the beginning of the like, 20th century. And uh, at that time, the Sagya Tritsin, he uh, gave his, uh, his, uh, his uh, permission, saying that this is authentic dharma. And, uh, and so after that, this uh, dharma, uh, this dharma is, uh, is about the uh, Guru Jabo, and uh, this Guru Jabo form is uh, quite, uh, in some ways uh, unique. It's a nine head and uh, 18 arms. Uh, it's called the Deshe uh, Sangwa Gundu. And uh, so this is a six uh, Charu Rinpoche. So, uh, so before 1959, so this Dharma only practiced in Charu Monastery in Nanchen. So after 1959, uh, when uh, six uh, uh, Charu Rinpoche escaped to 
Nepal, and he re-established the Chari Monastery in, in Nepal. So he, uh, he added further rituals in, uh, into this uh, set as a complete set. So he added uh, like a Tso offering, and uh, also like uh, the, the fire bujas, uh, uh, th this kind of uh, practice. And uh, so, uh, and, and uh, Chari Moche, he uh, taught uh, this uh, tradition, uh, th this Dharma practice uh, to the Dengar Moche. Dengar Moche is uh, actually is not from Sakya, it's uh, from the Gamagaji school. And uh, they were very good friends. So he taught this to Dengar Moche. And uh, so this is just uh, the, the, the sadhana printed in 1985 in, in, in Dharadun. And uh, after uh, six Chari Rinpoche passed away, then Dengar Rinpoche gave this teaching back to the seventh, uh, the, the new reincarnation, seventh Chari Rinpoche. And uh, the Dengar Rinpoche also gave this Dharma teaching to the present uh, Zongsa Qingzhi Rinpoche. And the Zongsa Qingzhi Rinpoche also again gave this, uh, uh, th this, uh, this teaching back to the present seven Chari Rinpoche. And uh, because Chari Rinpoche and uh, uh, the Chari Monastery was, uh, 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 is belonging to the Ngor tradition. And uh, so right now in, the, in Sakya, in the Ngor tradition, this uh, Dharma practice became very uh, popular. And uh, uh, so here I, I I, I just uh, give you some examples. So, for example, the uh, the present Ludin Kerimboche last week, October seventh, he uh, is leading uh, this uh, this year's annual practice of uh, this uh, Dharma Guru Jabo practice in the Charu Mon Monastery in Nepal. So this is a uh, this is a picture my friend sent sent to me. This is a picture uh, just shot last week, and uh, Ludin Kerimboche. So. Actually, this is in the retreat center of the Chari Monastery. So he led the, uh, 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 all the retreat lamas together to do this uh, puja. Okay. And, uh, and uh, uh, in, traditionally in Sakya uh, school, uh, during the 10th day or the 20, 25th day of each month, they practice the kadrima. Uh, but, uh, the, but right now, in, because of this dharma's uh, fame, so the Chari centers in Taiwan, so they, uh, they practice uh, this uh, Guru Jabo Dharma instead at the 10th day and, and the 25th day. Okay, and uh, uh, this year, uh, the Chari center in Taiwan, they invite uh, uh, an old Lama, Zhang Keju. Uh, he was the attendant of the former uh, sixth Chari Rinpoche, and he was uh, he is a he is an expert on this dharma practice. So he uh, this year in May and uh, June he was invited to Taiwan to conduct several ceremonies about uh, this uh, practice. So this is the ad advertisement in, 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 in Taiwan, and uh, so this is uh, this is the puja being conducted in the I think in his uh, Kaohsiung Center. And uh, so the last one is, uh, uh, I just take one very short uh, video about the practice. So that is the old Lama, Zhang Yang Keju. Okay, so I will stop here because the, the time's already up. Okay, thank you. Yeah, just a curious question. Uh, sort of how many followers or how popular is the, the Tama tradition in, in Taiwan this, in, and how is it presented? Sort of who, who are the followers basically, sort of lay people? How uh, many is it sort of possible to? You mean the Dharma in general or these two? These, these two these you two. presented. Yeah. Uh, I think mainly the disciples, uh, those two Rinpoche are mm -hmm. uh, disciples. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, because the Red Dara Dharma is on, only taught to the, to the, to the disciple, it's very recent, only since uh, 2011. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, uh, I think it's not many people, uh, right now maybe not so many disciples 
doing this uh, practice. Maybe no more than maybe no more than fifty, I, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, but for the Chari Rinpoche, uh, this is a guru job of practice because Chari Rinpoche he came to Taiwan quite early mm -hmm. in the late nineteen eighties, and uh, he encouraged this uh, practice a lot. And uh, uh, and because he he said. Uh, uh, his uh, Chari monastery is now is so prosperous. Mm -hmm. It's all because of the blessing of this dharma. So he encouraged uh, his disciples to do to do this practice. And uh, and so the text already uh, translated the, the sadhana already already translated into Chinese. And uh, uh, I I I cannot say how many, but uh, because Chari Rinpoche is. Uh, uh, his disciples quite a lot mm -hmm. and also I was told that uh, uh, some of the lay disciples they invited lamas to to their like a company mm -hmm. to do this uh, Guru Jabba Buddha for blessing because uh, it is said that this Buddha is for uh, has special blessing for accumulating mm -hmm. merit so yeah. also so, for healing, I'm guessing, it's yes. also good for actual yes, diseases yes, that yeah, people might yes. have. So this group shall practice now in Taiwan, mm -hmm. especially in the Sakya school mm -hmm. in Taiwan is quite uh, well known now. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you.